Let's move on and demystify the topic that is the performance pyramid. My students have trouble with this. It's the trickiest of the non-financial performance management models. And it's also been flagged in recent examiner's reports as a topic that is often done badly by students. So let's dive into this. In order to understand the performance pyramid, we need to go to a different chapter of your notes, a different syllabus area, and we also need to appreciate that the topics, the toolbox of performance management that you learn in APM, they're connected. So it's difficult to look at one topic in isolation under a microscope and really understand it without appreciating the big picture. Earlier in your studies, when you learned about strategic planning and control, you learned about the hierarchy of, of objectives. In order to manage performance at the high level of the company, we should have an appreciation of the company's mission. Why do we exist? How does the company make the world a better place for its stakeholders? What are the company's values? The mission of the company helps us understand these ideas. Once we have a clear idea of our mission, we can then set meaningful objectives. And we like these objectives to be aligned with our mission. So if we look at a company like The Body Shop, who put a strong focus on corporate social responsibility, fair trade, no animal testing. So a company like this they put their values front and center and they position themselves in the marketplace with these values. So if one of the directors came up with an objective, hey, let's cut our costs by using cheaper, low quality materials. And let's not worry about this fair trade business anymore. This is driving our costs up. Let's just find the cheapest stuff we can find. Well, that objective might increase profits, but it would not be aligned with their mission. And hopefully directors would reject such an objective. So moral of the story, a company's objectives should be aligned with their mission. Then control begins. And in order to control, we need to understand critical success factors. What areas of business performance does the company need to get right? so they can reach their objectives, outcompete their competitors. Once we understand the organization's critical success factors, we can then define KPIs that measure each of these important areas of performance. If quality is a critical success factor, we could measure defects per million. If safety is a critical success factor, success factor for an aut automotive manufacturer, we could measure crash test performance. Once we've defined our KPIs, we can then measure performance and manage performance using one of the formal frameworks that are introduced in syllabus area C. And that's the link between the strategic control cycle that you learned about earlier in your textbook with the performance management models that you learn about later in your textbook, of which the performance pyramid is one. Let's now drill down into syllabus area C, where you can find the performance management frameworks, and you are responsible for five of them. All of these are in syllabus area C. Syllabus area C will always be examined in section B of the exam. So this is a really important topic to study. The first framework that you need to know is that balanced scorecard. From the 1980s, this is the model that started it all. Balanced scorecard promotes measuring performance from a financial and a non-financial perspective, the modern approach. You know the balance scorecard, you love the balance scorecard.
You've got to know it for your exam. The next model that is often introduced is the building block model. Building block model is an evolution of the balanced scorecard, 1990s, and it was created to meet the needs of service organizations. And it's quite similar to the balanced scorecard. It begins with the dimensions of performance, the broad areas of success under which we should measure a company's performance. Once we define our company's dimensions of performance, we can then create performance standards, performance targets. At this point, the building block model is very similar to the balanced scorecard. We define areas of performance, then we come up with KPIs or performance metrics, targets. What makes the building block model different is we then add the HR aspect of rewards. Okay. So that's what makes the building block model different from the balanced scorecard. I know what you're thinking, guys. So you're, you're thinking, I want to learn about the performance pyramid, not this stuff. Well, guys, you can only appreciate the performance pyramid, and this is one of the reasons it's not well understood, is you got to know the background, and this is the background. So the next model that you often cover, the most difficult model, and that is the performance pyramid. So don't think of this performance pyramid as some standalone, isolated topic. It is simply a framework that helps us decide upon a range of KPIs, financial and non-financial, to help us understand company performance. Now, what makes this one div different, this is another evolution. Now we're recognizing that an organization has different levels. And the objectives of each level will be different. However, they cascade down from the organization's vision. So here we see another hierarchy of objectives. The syllabus is linked in many ways. So if you talk about the performance pyramid, you say we would like objectives aligned with the organization's vision. Vision is synonymous with mission. If you get performance pyramid, they'll tell you the high level goal of the company is to maximize shareholder wealth. That would be the vision in that context. Now, in order to achieve, to reach the vision, we need objectives cascading down. To manage performance, we then need a framework of KPIs. KPIs then, moving upwards, KPIs then aligning with the vision. So that's the story behind the performance pyramid. It is another model that we can use to help us capture a range of performance metrics to measure performance of a company. The next problem with this model is it's overwhelming with all of the details. Remember, the trend in the exams is to help you with the model diagrams. So don't panic if you don't remember every piece of the model. In the recent exams, the trend has been to provide you with a diagram of the model as an appendix. This way you're not spending your time describing the pieces of the model, wasting your time with that, but you're using the model as a performance management tool in the evaluation of a performance report or something else. Here's the performance pyramid again. At the top is the corporate vision, highest level objective of the company. Now at the bottom, we have operational 
performance. The performance pyramid promotes measuring quality, defects per million, percentage of our products that come back with a warranty claim in the first year, delivery time, on-time delivery rate. So that would be measuring the external areas of operational performance. Then we have cycle time, that would be time per unit, efficiency, materials per unit, how much waste are we generating? And moving up, those areas of performance then support the mid-level of the company. If we have high quality and on-time delivery, we're going to have happy customers. We could measure customer satisfaction. We could measure percentage of our customers that would recommend us to a friend. If we have efficient production, if our cycle time is low, time per unit is low, waste is low, we have high productivity. In the middle here, we have flexibility. Do we offer different levels of service? If we are a delivery company, if we're DHL, do we have same day delivery, two day delivery, three day delivery? Can we deliver an envelope? Can we deliver a heavy package? Could we deliver an elephant for the circus? Well, probably not every level of flexibility, but we'll try to reach as much as we can. If we can do well under these areas of performance, we're going to grow our market share and we'll be generating high profits. And if we can do well under these divisional areas of performance, hopefully we're reaching the corporate vision. That's what the performance pyramid is all about. But remember, in APM, you're not going to give a long-winded, dry, academic definition of the model. You're likely going to use the model, one, to evaluate a performance report that someone else did. So you use this model to review someone else's performance report. Does the performance report cover the internal and the external perspectives? Do we see all levels of the business covered? Then you drill down into it and then you can start looking for pieces of the pyramid in the performance report in question. Oh, look, the performance report we're looking at, it's all financial, okay? There's nothing about quality. There's nothing about delivery. No wonder the customers are not happy in the scenario. The company's measuring market share, but we see that it's dropping. So the company is not on track to reach their vision. That's the way you use the model when you're evaluating a report. Another way this model is used is to evaluate someone else's KPIs. And several times they've said, use the operational level of the pyramid. That has come up twice. One criticism in the examiner's reports was that students use the whole model. So if they say operational level, only use the operational areas of performance. So then you would look at the KPIs provided in one of the exhibits and you just simply go through them. Does that KPI measure quality in the context of the scenario? How about delivery? How about time per unit? How about materials per unit? Okay, overall, that's efficiency.